Hi class, welcome to the online session. We are going to tackle four slides for this session. These are all coming from the esophagus and the stomach. So what we have slide 116 would be herpes simplex esophagitis. And then we have slide 101 that is chronic gastritis. Slide 102 that is peptic ulcer. And 103 that is adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so for our first slide, this is uh, this is slide one one six. This is herpes simplex esophagitis, and uh, we always would look at the particular tissue. This is coming from the esophagus, so we would be able to identify for the presence of the stratified squamous epithelium. Herpes simplex esophagitis is caused by the herpes simplex virus and there are two variants, we have the 1 and 2. Most common cause would be 1, although we can have overlapping of, uh, of the, the particular variant. Uh, so this is characterized by the presence of ulcers. So if you're going to look at this particular slide, you can see the presence of these ulcers okay, interspersed, in, interspersed between normal tissues. So this is one ulcer, then you have another ulcer here, then this is normal. Okay, So you have what we call a punched out ulcer. So these are what we call as the punched out ulcer. And uh, the cells that are infected here would be the epithelial cells, the squamous cells. So there are inclusions that are present within the nucleus, which we would call them as the Caudry type A viral inclusions, which are found within the nucleus. So these are intranuclear inclusions. Again, they are called Caudry type A. Uh, we can also appreciate the presence of multinucleated cells here you can see the presence of multinucleated cells multinucleation so these are characteristic features for herpes simplex okay presence of cow dry type a nuclear inclusions the presence of multinucleated squamous cells okay next we have slide 101 this is chronic gastritis at this particular uh, cell, uh, this particular mucosal area. So chronic gastritis would be associated with Helicobacter pylori and autoimmune gastritis, although there are other causes for chronic gastritis, but those two are the most common. Again, Helicobacter pylori infection and autoimmune gastritis. So in our patients, they would complain of nausea. Uh, they would also complain of upper abdominal pain, which are the typical symptoms. And then uncommon symptoms would be hematemesis. Okay. So let's start with the H. pylori infection. So in H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori, uh, the, the virulence for that particular organism, to why it would be able to, uh, to survive in such uh, environment like an intensely low pH that is in the stomach. So there are virulence factors that are involved for its survival. So number one is the presence of the flagella. So with the flagella, it's able to move around uh, the area. And then next we have the urease, which is secreted and it is generated, uh, it generates ammonia which can enhance the bacterial survival and it will increase the gastric pH. Number three is the, the use of adhesions. So the adhesions would permit the H. pylori to adhere to the foveolar epithelial cells. And then we have the release of toxins. 
like the cytotoxin uh, associated gene A, which is being uh, secreted or released by H. pylori. So when we are going to perform a biopsy, usually we get an antral, uh, antral located biopsy. Okay? What are the things that we have to look for? So chronic gastritis. So after, because of its name, we look for chronic inflammation. Inflammation of the stomach. So, what we would see would be the presence of mononuclear cells. Lymphocytes, like this, like this, they are fairly common in the lamina propria of the gastrointestinal tract. Okay? But the moment that you see the presence of these cells, what are these? Plasma cells. So, the moment that you see plasma cells, you are thinking of chronic inflammation. So, next is we look for activity of the neutrophil. Okay? So, we can see neutrophilic activity within the, within the stroma like this. Or like this. Uh, or the presence of intraepithelial neutrophils. Okay? So, then this time we are going to call it as chronic active gastritis and then another thing that you have to look for when it is long-standing we would see the presence of these features look at this they are features that we would see in the small and large intestine what are these these are what we call as goblet cells okay so when we have goblet cells it means that there's intestinal Metaplasia. So in this case, it's long-standing. We would have chronic active gastritis, chronic because of the presence of the plasma cells, active because of the presence of neutrophils in the epithelium, intraepithelial, and in the stromal, and lastly would be the presence of intestinal metaplasia. So chronic active gastritis with intestinal metaplasia. So, um, loss of parietal cells, in this case, where do we find that usually at the lower portion in the, of the gastric glands, we would see the parietal cells and the chief cells. In long-standing H. pylori infection, they will be lost and this will cause atrophy. So, the other cause for chronic gastritis would be an autoimmune gastritis and this would be associated with antibodies against the parietal, parietal cells in the intrinsic factor. So the moment that you have those antibodies, they destroy the parietal cells, they destroy the intrinsic factor, we would have vitamin B12 deficiency, there would be decrease in gastric acid secretion leading to atrophy. Okay? So the, the type of inflammation here would be chronic gastritis, but we do not see the presence of neutrophilic intemperates. So we only see the presence of plasma cells and macrophages, no neutrophils. Okay, that is chronic gastritis, secondary to H. pylori, and secondary to autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease. Next, we have slide 102. So this is peptic ulcer. Okay, peptic ulcer disease, or PUD. Uh, peptic ulcer disease is found in the stomach and in the in the duodenum. So this is the, this type of condition is seen with Helicobacter pylori infection. So H. pylori infection uh, can be the reason for a lot of conditions in the stomach. And uh, another would be smoking, and another would be the use of NSAIDs. Okay, so. These factors can lead to an imbalance in the mucosal defense and will lead to chronic gastritis and it will lead to atrophy and ulcer. Okay? So, where do we find the ulcers? They are more common in the anterior wall of the proximal duodenum. Again, it is located, most common location would be the anterior wall 
of the proximal duodenum. Okay? In the stomach, it is also present, but it is more common in the duodenum. Okay? And in the stomach, it is usually located in the lesser curvature. Okay? So, if we're going to look at the slide, okay, so we would see the presence of an ulcer from this point up to this point. Okay? So, ulcers that are less than 0 0.3, like I think this is less than 0 0.3, they are shallow. It means that uh, only the epithelial lining would be sloughed off or would be ulcerated. But if it's more than 0 0.6, it may be deeper. It may uh, present with necrotic debris in the, in the submucosa and even the muscularis. Okay? So, what would be the symptoms of our patient? Okay? So, the pain, okay, that's an upper abdominal pain, it can manifest 1 to 3 hours after a bleed and would be even worse at night. That's around 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. So make sure that you are not taking in too much NSAIDs or smoking, okay? Uh, so this is relieved by taking in uh, alkali, okay, the antacids or food intake. So what would we see? The presence of this ulcer containing uh, necrotic debris there okay we have a lot of necrotic debris and then we would see the presence of a lot of segmenters or neutrophils in the area okay what is located underneath here we have the presence of granulation tissue granulation tissue would be identified with presence of vascular uh, uh, vascular proliferation, presence of mononuclear cell infiltrates, and fibroblasts. And our last slide for this session would be the adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Okay. So, this is from the stomach just for a review. Maybe you, you are not familiar or you might have forgotten okay, what to look for when you are looking at the mucosa. Okay? So you always look for this asymmetric cells. Okay? What are these? Parietal cells. Okay? So the moment that you see them, then you are sure that you are in the stomach. Okay? What's this one? This is the muscularis mucosa. Okay? So finish with a part of histology. Okay, so this uh, adenocarcinoma would account for 90% of stomach cancers and or gastric cancers. The precursor lesions would be, would be the presence of a dysplasia or adenoma. And some of the risk factors that we have would be the presence, again, of the H. pylori. Okay, the prevalence of H. pylori, so not just ulcer, not just chronic gastritis, but even presence of uh, malignancy. Diet. Uh, when we consume a lot of food that has food preservatives, preserved through salt and smoke, we can take in n nitrous compounds and benzopyrene, which can lead to mutation. So what are the mutations that we would see? We have for familial and sporadic diffuse, okay? Because we have two variants for gastric cancer. So we have the diffuse and then we have the intestinal type. So for the familial and sporadic diffuse cancer, it is associated with CDH1 inactivation. Whereas for the sporadic, uh, for the sporadic intestinal type, of gastric cancer, it's APC, okay, or adenomatous polyposis coli. Okay, so um, those would with FAP or familial adenomatous polyposis uh, syndrome 
would have increased risk for the intestinal type. Okay? And the other uh, mutated genes would be the BRCA2, BRCA2, and the P53. Okay. So, grossly, when we see bulky masses, bulky masses uh, within the gastric lumen, think of intestinal type. But if you see that there would be thickening of the, of the wall, of the gastric can of the stomach think of diffuse okay so you know the typical adenocarcinoma glandular pattern okay that is the intestinal type on the other hand if you see the presence of this cell so you are looking at the mucosa this would be the muscular mucosa there are cells a lot of cells present in the submucosa are they plasma cells? Okay. Uh, are they histiocytes? Okay. So, this type of cells are what we call as the signatrine cells. Okay. Why? Because they appear to have abundant mucus, abundant mucin. Okay. So, they are called signatrine because they are shaped like the ring. You have the eccentrically located or peripherally located nucleus that is dark and then you have abundant mucus. Okay? So this is the diffuse type of cancer and this is the one with poor prognosis. Okay? So what are the most powerful prognostic factors in, the, in stomach cancer or gastric cancer? The presence of nodal and distant metastasis. Nodal and distant metastasis. Okay? So those are the slides that we have for this session. So kindly read your book for any clarification. Okay? Because our reference would be uh, Robbins. Okay? So stay safe and good night.